Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Marion Edinger. I'm director of the San Antonio Museum of Art, and I would like to welcome you to one of the great historic days uh, in the museum's history and in the city's history. Um, today, of course, we inaugurate the, the wonderful uh, River North and the uh, Museum Reach. Uh, a lot of people have worked very, very long and hard and in a very, very collaborative way to see that this uh, day uh, became a reality. Uh, we are thrilled because it's going to bring life uh, to this part uh, of San Antonio. It's been very, very lonely here for 25 years. Uh, there's just been no one around us. And so uh, we think that what has happened uh, with this extension is going to be, in terms of the history of the museum, the most important thing, the most important occasion since we opened in 1981. Um, many of us attended the uh, festivities, uh, the sort of ribbon cutting, if you will, uh, up at the uh, locks. And one of the comments uh, that was made is that, um, you know, this is a day where uh, San Antonio, uh, not trying to doing a, a version of, a, sort of a Disney version of the downtown river walk, but taking a new approach, uh, having a lineal park, incorporating uh, and celebrating contemporary art, and looking at what we have here, what are the special qualities of this part of the river, and the response of uh, the artists who were finally chosen uh, to uh, enhance this part of the river and become part of this part of the river is unbelievable, it's humbling. And our ears and eyes on the committee uh, was, of course, David Rubin, who's our wonderful uh, curator of contemporary art. And David, um, you know, you, he's, David's a little bit like a Boston bull. You know, he will get in and fight for contemporary art, as you've all seen. <laughs> and so, you know, he um, has, has really informed, I think, in a tremendous way, and knows each of the artists, has come to, to know them and respects them, and is going to uh, say some comments in just a moment. I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the River Foundation, San Antonio River Foundation, because they're the ones who shepherded this thing. Um, <laughs> through and you know this ain't an easy time to, to to look for money but they've done a marvelous absolutely marvelous job and today is our day to celebrate so David thank you and welcome uh, before we begin I'd like to make uh, two Brief announcements of three, actually. First, please turn off your cell phones. Second, um, there will be a point when we reach an hour where we're going to take a pause. I'll be signaled that it's time to take a pause so we can change the tape. This program is being videotaped. Um, and thirdly, it is also being um, audio taped by Ernie Villarreal from Texas Public Radio. So if you want to hear the program again later on Texas Public Radio, just go to their website. It will be available as a podcast. So, and thank you, TPR. Now, um, before we begin the program with today's panelists, I'd like to introduce someone who is very responsible for overseeing what you see on the river now with all these uh, amazing public art projects. The project director, uh, Mike Adkison, who uh, was born in, uh, yes, let's give him applause. <laughs> <laughs> Mike was born in Corpus Christi. Uh, he is an architectural designer and the founder of Adapt, Adapt Responder Designs. Starting in 1998, he be began creating residential and commercial projects that step outside the boundaries of conventional design and construction. In addition, he has been assisting and consulting with artists through the Art Pace Residency Program since 1997. In June of 2008, he accepted the position of Art and Architecture Project Manager for the San Antonio River Foundation. And of course, in less than a year, we have this splendid addition, historic addition to San Antonio. So Mike, would you come up here and just say a few words about the project and, and uh, what it is and why it's so important?
thanks, David. I just want to say thanks to SAMA for putting all of this together. We really appreciate it. The uh, River Foundation is a very small group, three full-time staff in a very small space, and we couldn't have done this without them, and they've been incredibly supportive throughout this whole um, amazing process. Um, the River Foundation commissioned eight artists to work on 12 projects as a part of this, this reach, and we had an incredibly challenging uh, 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 time schedule to put all of this together. Um, it was, you know, in public art, a lot of times you'll do open calls. There are a variety of ways that you'll, you'll put together the group of artists, and because of the short time frame, uh, they put together an invitational, and they basically sent out invitations to a variety of artists, and these are the guys who are crazy enough to say yes to uh, basically one year start to finish. Uh, their conceptual proposals came in in August, so we're looking at nine months, really, to be honest. Uh, amazing. You'll look at this group of men here, and many of you may wonder why are there are no women. Uh, there were women who were asked. And they were smart enough to say, what? How short a time frame? Oh, no, no, no. C call me when you've got a, you know, a, a, a comprehensible schedule. Um, what I can say is this, that basically there were no plans um, to do anything to the bridges. You've got this huge infrastructure project for this museum reach project. And, you know, a lot of money being spent. But really, in terms of experience, without doing these kinds of projects, this whole linear, pro this linear procession that is the museum reach would have been punctuated by bridges that were kind of falling apart. Um, concrete and rebar exposed, lots of graffiti. So imagine going along these sidewalks, beautifully landscaped, and your experience is punctuated by these kind of uh, crumbling pieces of infrastructure. The foundation stepped in. Um, to do these projects and to take each of these kind of dark, neglected, uh, abandoned undersides of bridges and railings and turn them into destinations and places along the way and, and portals, gateways along the procession. So we have this group of gentlemen here who've done an absolutely amazing job. My title is Art and Architecture Project Manager, which sounds fairly boring, but this was really, really exciting, really, really amazing. and I'm. Uh, fortunate to have participated and fortunate to have worked with so many great people. Thanks so much. Okay, the format for the program will be as follows. Um, I will be introducing each artist when we deal with their work rather than all of them at once because it will be a lot of credentials to roll out at once. So um, the artist uh, that I introduce will come up here. They're actually seated in the order that their works are placed on the river and that's the order that we'll look at their projects. Um, they'll each come up and we'll see some images of their earlier work, some images of the current project plans and the actual production and results of the current project. And uh, we'll try to keep our dialogues to about 10 minutes each, hopefully. And then we'll have a half an hour. Uh, I'll start the discussion by throwing a few general questions out to the group who will answer as they will. And then we'll open it up to all of you in the audience. So it's hopefully going to be a very stimulating couple of hours. And to get it rolling, I'd like to introduce our first artist, Martin Richmond. Uh, he's a native of Hampshire, England, and he studied at Portsmouth College of Art and Design and St. Mar Martin's College of Art in London. After a successful career as a lighting designer for rock shows and theater, uh, Martin began to focus purely on art in 1985. He is internationally known for his colorful, glowing sculptures and installations, and he's done numerous public art commissions, some of which we'll now see. So, Martin, would you join me up here? Martin Richmond, okay. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this project from 1995. Um, this is a, an old railway bridge in Bethnal Green, and uh, it was a subject of an architecture competition. Um, and I think they invited about um, uh, 50 or 100 architecture students to make proposals for that. Uh, unfortunately, they were unable to use any of the designs. And I was approached by one of the panel, judging panel members who knew my work. And frankly, I was loath to do it. I thought, what, I don't really do things like light bridges. 
Um, and, um, but the thing is, it was probably 10 minutes walk from my house, and it was in a very, very, very sad and horrible state. And in the end, I had, I think there's something like eight lamps there, or six lamps, and a repaint of the bridge. And I never really held it up as a great sort of piece of art. But what I did think it was, was an extremely successful transformation of a very inhospitable space into a very defined bit of city place. And I had people, um, sort of East End ladies going, oh, you bloke what done that bridge, we really love that. And <laughs> artists would go home, artist friends of mine said they would go home a different route to sort of engage with the space. And I'd know that girlfriends would meet boyfriends under the bridge and that sort of thing. And it went, it was there for what, something like three years and now it's in a state of semi-terminal decline again and uh, needs the same sort of refreshment. Um, this one, yeah. yeah. Um, I was approached by Bristol, uh, Bristol, uh, I think Bristol Council to make some proposals for some beacons that they wanted in their, um, it's not exactly their main street, I, I'm, it's a bit hard to describe, but it's a street that leads down to a riverfront, uh, a kind of an old dock really, and um, it, was a, it was a site of big urban renewal, so there were a number of architectural firms who were putting in um, squares and fountains and benches and lampposts and more fountains and more benches. Um, and um, I propose these Millennium Beacons, as they're called, and they're about a metre, so they're um, a yard, um, just about a yard in diameter, that sort of size. And um, they're made of um, perforated stainless steel. And if you look at the top right, you can see they're sort of set in a tripartite fashion and they're illuminated, and they're, they're quite interesting because they dissolve their materiality. Um, they, when the external lights are on, it, they look very substantial, and, um, <coughs> excuse me, and a, a singular surface. And then once those dissolve, the internal lights come on, and the th piece itself becomes an airy, um, ambiguous kind of space again. Um, I quite enjoy these sort of moire interruption patterns that happen where the parts of the um, uh, the parts of the perforations interact with one another. And I'm often looking for an ambiguous dissolved space, I suppose, is this, and uh, perceptually ambiguous. Uh, materials and spaces to work with. And, and I think we're going to see how you've done that very successfully in San Antonio. So let's look at a couple more earlier examples, such as this installation from East London. Um, yep. Uh, uh, well, this was, again, a somewhat neglected bit of a colonnade in a very highly resolved district of the city. Um, this area is quite interesting, particularly in light of your new river development, because in the, I guess in the early 80s, there was an, uh, uh, an uh, what do you call it, a sort of movement to, um, uh, <coughs> to transform the now defunct and neglected London docks. And that is now a big, urb, sort of really urban centre with a lot of offices and a lot of very high um, sort of semi British style skyscraper buildings. Um, and it's a lot of private spaces. So this is one of the private spaces. Um, and so it's managed by the Canary Wharf. So it doesn't belong to the city. And they approached me and said, could you do something with this space? Because it felt oppressive and um, somewhat intimidating, but it was very used by a lot of people. and. I, and there's a, so it's a bit hard to really explain this, but there's, um, there's a station platform above 
And the... the headlights up there. Yeah, the headlights, I don't know quite what they are. They're nothing to do with me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's just... Um, I, but what I've done is make a kind of floating ceiling and, um, and put sort of fish tank-like boxes that are translucent. And I've lit the fish tank-like boxes in a kind of glowing violet light and a very bright, bright pink light within the floating ceilings, if I can say it like that. And part of my intention, frankly, was to sort of disrupt the rather material and commercial nature of the space and to bring a sort of... Because it's a kind of... It's a very um, office environment, I should say. Um, very grey. And um, I rather like the sort of shocking pink uh, element. But I've got to say that the uh, managing director of Canary Wharf came down, took one look at it and said... We're going to keep some lights on here. This is too much. And uh, he wasn't able... Um, so to some extent, I felt as though I'd been fairly successful. Uh, um, um, I don't know what else to add to that, but except that it's a similar kind of aesthetic that I'm trying to create. And in many ways, you can see that I've made a sort of bed of light. And it's a very similar kind of idea to the sort of spirit that I've introduced onto the Lexington Bridge where it is reflected in the surface below and it creates a kind of, at its best, it creates a whole space around you. The reflection becomes part of the conversation. The reflection becomes part of the conversation, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let's look at the, this one. Um, this was one of those... Can I just move this a little yeah, bit? Is that, yeah. um, this was potentially one of those rather dreamlike projects because you can spend an awful lot of time as an artist working in the public realm in England where you travel endlessly to provincial towns um, which aren't necessarily the happiest places to be. Um, and this one was um, an invitation to go and make a piece of work on a beach in the Lido just outside Venice. And there was virtually no budget and I sort of had a couple of ideas, and it was just to do with sandcastles, really. And so we, we bought some very inexpensive buckets um, with translucent. I had some ultraviolet tubes. We dug holes in the sand, wired together all the UV tubes, put, a, put one of these buckets on top of each one, and I made a little mini maze with paving slabs that were around on the beach anyway. Um, and ha I had some fluorescent powder that I then sprinkled onto the sand. And it became a sort of... It, it actually, it was a very engaging piece in the end. And it was a very spontaneously... Semi-spontaneously created. I had a good idea about what I wanted to do. But I didn't know what materials would be to hand. And... Um, there were some sort of fabulous moments because there were these huge creatures that would land in the fluorescing powder and then try and take off again <laughs> with their wings slightly sort of unbalanced and there'd be these kind of fluorescing things flying around very erratically and it seemed like part of the installation to me. I really enjoyed that element of it. Um, Rather different situation, um, a, a, quite an upmarket hotel in the centre of London. Um, <clears throat> um, the woman who owns the hotel has a few other rather high-end hotels in the centre of London, around Soho, uh, etc. And she, over the years, she's bought a number of pieces of mine to... Um, to have in her libraries in the hotels uh, predominantly. In this particular time, they wanted a swimming pool in the basement of the hotel. Um, there are endless stories about this, but I don't think we've got time for them. Suffice to say that it's a f it's, um, I think it's about five metre long, so 16, 18 feet or so long. Um, and sadly, I can't remember quite how high it is. But um, And what it... What it consists of are singular bars of LED lights. So there are 10 bars of light. 
and you can have each bar any color you like but you can only have them in those horizontal lines and the horizontal line is exactly the width of the pool so it relates again to the water um, it sort of it's in dialogue with its own reflection in a way um, um, an early an earlyish public commission um, Another sort of, you know, all my, all these things are full of s stories, and as soon as I see them again, all the traumas and tribulations of creating them <laughs> come rushing back to me like some sort of nightmare thing. Um, <laughs> um, but this was a, this is a large energy from waste. So they take people's household waste, burn it, treat the smoke, clean everything up, and recycle the energy back into the grid, the national grid. Um, <clears throat> it's a big building and it's on a fairly major road between Birmingham and Coventry in the Midlands in England. And they realised they couldn't mask it with um, growing trees around it or something similar. So they decided to try and make it into a work of art. And I... I hadn't dealt with anything on this kind of scale before, but I had a few ideas about what I wanted to do. And um, they ended up offering me the commission. And uh, I worked with um, a very charming architect on the project who was very open to my um, input, shall I say. And we ended up not really changing the design of the building because the building was very pragmatically designed but changing some of the materials that the building was constructing it of. And I added actually very little in the way of extra light, but I allowed the light that was in there already to be revealed through these translucent and transparent claddings that we added. And again, I would talk about taking something like this and making it dematerialized and uh, getting a sense of a floating space. Um, I enjoy the... I enjoy the Ch Japanese and Chinese ideas of a floating world where there isn't the sort of this idea of a hierarchical or, um, sorry, I've forgotten what depth of perception. Uh, never mind, let's go behind. Well, let's What's go it called when you look to Renaissance, Renaissance paintings or perspective? Perspective, yeah. thank you. So, um, so um, yeah. to keep, keep things moving, um, we're going to move now into the current project. If you'll give us just a brief explanation of your proposal, and then we'll look at the project. OK. Um, well, the proposal is pretty much, I think that was the proposal, was it not? I think, yes. yes. Um, and um, um, I, there's a series of adverts in England, advertisements that go, um, it does what it says on the can. And in some ways, I feel that that does more or less describe what you're going to get with that bridge. Um, um, these are dichroic acrylic, and the dichroic element means that they have, they reflect one, they transmit one colour and reflect its opposite. <coughs> it's complementary. So I found it to be a fabulous tool to use in various forms in my work, and. I've made mobiles in, of this kind of material, and I've made big installations in city streets of sculptures using the film, but not in that particular form. And <clears throat> so I enjoy, again, this sort of um, the color, which isn't a fixed color. It's a very mutable thing. And according to the, where the light is and where your perceptual position is, it changes constantly. So um, I wanted to introduce what I think of as elements of my studio practice into the site. So I wanted to these things to the 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 site and my work to be responsive to one another. And what I hope I've done is integrated the kind of spirit of my practice into the site in such a way so that there's a kind of coherent dialogue with them. And the underneath of the bridge has a beam structure 
which is a bit like a tessellated form. And I wanted the upper parts of the deck, of, under deck of the bridge um, to retreat and to be pushed further away. So they're painted a darker blue and the sides where the, um, the what's become known as light chimes are hanging um, ha has been painted white to receive. Shall we look at it? Little yep. Bit yeah. 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 Yep. There we are go. we there? Yeah, you're installing it. Here, you can see it on the laptop. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> 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 oh, there I am, embarrassingly. Oh, uh, yes, okay. Um, that was me pretending to do some physical work. <laughs> um, um, it's, it was a pretty scruffy and neglected bit of space there, but... I enjoyed the triple archingness of it. Um, it's got a certain elegance to it, and it had been very unloved. Um, and originally, I had a scheme that was going to encompass the upper part of the parapet of the bridge as well, but there was some um, disinterest, shall I say, from uh, people who think it's. Uh, that the, they don't want to interfere with that part of it. So um, this all goes on underneath. And in some, in some ways, I've got to say, it's a bit of a regret, because I think it would have been a whole other piece of work had I been able to engage with the top part as well. Well, I think it's pretty spectacular, and let's show people why. OK, thanks. <laughs> okay. Well, that's looking good. They're fabulous. <laughs> Very nice pictures. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks, David. Um, are we all right? Do you want to um, just kind of comment? I guess now that it's it's done, how you how you look at it, how it feels. I, I'm 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 pretty happy with it. Um, the first few days, uh, I wasn't quite sure what I had, and one tends to have a problem about only seeing the pro problems with it and only seeing the things that are wrong rather than the things that are right. But over the last couple of days, I've been watching it at night and. One of the, th there's, there are two or three elements what, that I really enjoy. It responds to the wind, so it changes constantly. So you can go down there one day and you've got one kind of quality of experience and you can go down another day and it's very different. The other thing is the water. So the water is also constantly changing. So that also makes very different manifestations in terms of the reflection and the quality of the dialogue that goes on between the upper part and the reflected part, um, I think is very rich. So I really enjoy the, the times when it's kind of intentionally disrupting itself and the times when it's kind of very calm and placid. Um, and to me, it's starting to look like a whole kind of space with dissolved boundaries. And... Um, I enjoy both the sort of presence and the nothingness of it all. Um, and it's, it relates strongly to my own kind of studio practices uh, to do with kind of colour and light. And I think it's got some... I hope it's got some qualities that I've bought, that I've seen in San Antonio. There's a kind of life and colour and exuberance of the city streets here, which um, I've really enjoyed. And um, I guess that's it. Can thank I, you. I think. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. you might want to sit there so you can see everything. I might sit there. That yeah. would be better. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, next up will be Stuart Allen. Stuart studied architecture at Kansas University and graduated uh, from the photography and video department of the Kansas City Art Institute. His work deals with fundal elements of perception, light, time, gravity, and space, as he'll tell us. Um, he has exhibited photographs, kites, and sculpture, and of course, uh, some wonderful site-specific installations, including the one currently hanging in our great hall. So Stuart, will you come up and join me? You can see it here. Ah, thank you. <clears throat> so tell us a little bit about some of your earlier work. Okay. Well, this is a, um, a public installation at a police headquarters building in Davis, California. And one of the things that uh, we'll establish as a theme here today, I think, is um, there's kind of a sharp contrast between a lot of the materials I've used in the past and, and the current project down on the river. 
uh, sailcloth has been a, a material issue for maybe 10 years, and I've used this white fabric that I'm very fond of. It has a kind of a grid pattern in it, and I like the way it deals with light. I like the way it absorbs light and reflects light. And so a lot of these earlier installations uh, use this cloth to activate daylight within a particular architectural space. And the intention in with this piece was uh, I came in very early in the project and was able to work with the project architect to redesign the lobby really around the, the sculpture. It was a I think a unique relationship and that the architect was willing to, to do that. So we created a particular bank of lights and a particular configuration of the fabric so that it addressed the uh, artificial light in the at nighttime and the daylight coming through these uh, north facing windows during the day. Stuart, would you want to read the title for us and tell us a little <laughs> bit about it since it's a constant in your titles? Yeah. yeah. Do I really have to read the title? You um, do. Yeah. <laughs> 38 degrees, uh, 33 minutes and 5 seconds north, 121 degrees, 43 minutes and 10 seconds west. And the, with the site specific installations, as David said, I've, uh, I've had a habit of titling them based on the longitude and latitude coordinates of their site. They, they can only live in one place, they're designed for that one place only, and so it seems logical in my mind to pin them down very tightly to that place with their GPS coordinates. <laughs> <laughs> you can see it here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like to see it in the big screen, though. <laughs> uh, this is a more recent piece uh, entitled Seven, and it is also made with the uh, sailcloth and uh, aluminum and stainless steel hardware. I borrow a lot of materials from the sailing industry and lightweight aircraft types of um, connectors and, and mechanisms. And one of the other, I guess one of the other things that has cropped up a lot with this fabric work are these structures that have a relationship to tensile bridges, uh, fabric architecture, things where the, the structure kind of falls away and allows the fabric to float in a space. I'm interested in creating structures that have a lightness to them, um, kind of almost like the anti-Richard Serra uh, sort of mentality where I'm trying to create an object that occupies a lot of volume but uh, is actually extraordinarily lightweight and, and you know, hopefully has kind of a floating uh, sensation about it. And uh, of course Martin commented on the floating world and it seems like you, yeah. you and he have that interest in common. I think that, uh, yeah, Martin and I have more in common than we would care to admit, I think. <laughs> this, uh, this is the installation that's just on the other side of the wall here. Um, again, with the longitude and latitude coordinate title. Um, the, the Great Hall here at SAMA is an interesting space. It's, um, there, there's light entering it from above through the skylights, and there's a lot of light coming in from the north and south facades as well. When I was asked to, to make a piece for the Great Hall, it was important to me that the piece addressed the color of light and the quality of light coming from all of those different planes. So I took long reaches of fabric, it's again, it's the same sailcloth, and stretched them uh, horizontally across the space, as you can see at the level of the railing. And then I put a twist in the fabric so that half of the fabric is facing the north and south facades and half of the fabric is facing the ceiling. So that at any given point through the day uh, that there's a sort of a dichotomy going on between those two planes where north and south you're getting a certain color of light and from above you're getting a different color of light. And that's really the primary content of the piece in my mind is, is addressing those, the different sort of quality of light coming from those different directions. And of course, uh, Stuart, you lived in California at one time where you were very familiar with the California light and space absolutely. phenomenon. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you want to just say a word about what that is for people who don't know? Sure. I, I think that um, there's, a, a, again, to, to refer back to what Martin said as well, I think there's an, uh, an interest here that is, that is a common interest with the light and space artists from Southern California, uh, Robert Irwin and Jim Terrell and these, these characters, but, but this idea of um, dematerialization and taking an object and making an object so that